Hi guys. Well, I guess we're plunging ahead with this crazy idea to make an audio book of the book I wrote in 2009 called Peruvian Plunge about my summer I spent in the Peruvian Amazon jungle. And as I have mentioned, if you just want to buy the book for $5, go on lulu.com and order the book yourself. I will put the link here, but if you just want to sit around for 28, 29 videos listening to me read it, I'll be happy to do that. So we are finally, after that long-winded preface, we are ready to dive into Peruvian Plunge. Now, Peruvian Plunge was divided into two parts, plunge number one and plunge number two. So we kick off plunge number one with a quote from somewhere around the year 1600 from an Inca Indian writer named Waman Puma. But Waman was saying about Peru in 1600, quote, to write is to weep. The world now is in reverse, and there is no remedy in this kingdom of Peru. Thank you, in Inca Indian writer Waman Puma. So uh, we're going to kick off chapter book one, chapter one, into the green hell with my favorite. Uh, this is somewhat of a, a clipped quote from the famous acorn scene from Don Quixote, written basically the same year as the... Uh, our last fellow we heard from in Peru was talking about the world in reverse. This is what uh, <clears throat> Miguel Cervantes had to say about the world in roughly the year 1600. <clears throat> Quote, The heavy f curse of the plowshare had not yet dared to open or violate the merciful womb of our first mother. For she, without being forced, offered up everywhere across her broad and fertile bosom whatever would satisfy, sustain, and delight the children who then possessed her. There was no fraud, deceit, or malice mixed in with honesty and truth. Justice stood on her own ground, and favor or interest did not dare disturb or offend her as they so often do now, defaming, confusing, and persecuting her. This long harangue was declaimed by Don Quixote for the acorns served to him for dinner brought to his mind the golden age, and with the desire to make that foolish speech to the Gotthards, who, stupefied and perplexed, listened without saying a word, his squire... Sancho Panza uh, was too was silent and ate the acorns and made frequent trips to the second wineskin. Hallelujah, Miguel Cervante. So that is what the planet looked like from Peru to Spain. In around the year 1600, but we are now going to fast forward to Friday, May 22nd, 2009, when I traveled from Cusco to Atalaya, Peru. Atalaya means the watchtower. 
from Cusco to the Watchtower. <clears throat> My maiden voyage into the green hell of the Amazon rainforest, the day I had dreamed of for three dozen years, kicked off at 3.20 a.m. when I was routed from a fitful brush with sleep by the frantic peeping of my $4 Radio Shack alarm clock. The thermometer on the clock read 49 degrees Fahrenheit in my hotel room as I hurried to dress for my big adventure, covering myself with three layers of progressively warmer clothes, a process I planned to reverse as the day wore on and I descended from the frosty summit of the Andes to the steamy jungles of Atalaya some 5,000 meters, uh, about three miles below. My knees almost buckled under the oppressive weight of the bag of cannonballs I had packed for my 60-day trek into the wilderness. I had a brief fantasy of loading my cursed backpack onto the back of a llama where it belonged, but alas, no llamas were to be found at that time of night. I stumbled through the narrow front gate of the hotel out into the chilly pre-dawn pre darkness of Cusco. One small step for Hambone the tourist, one giant leap for Hambone the spiritual warrior. I had made careful and detailed arrangements with Frederico the Cusco cabbie to meet me at 4 a.m. where the narrow pedestrians only alleyway intersected the closest point accept accessible by taxis. It goes without saying that Frederico was nowhere to be seen to be seen on the deserted street. By some miracle I actually managed to flag down another taxi after only six blocks of slogging through the night's accumulated dog shit of Cusco's pothole-plagued streets. Ten minutes later, at the auspicious hour of 4.20, we had left the relative sanity and security of Cusco's gringo tourist district, San Blas, to wash up onto the dark and empty and foreboding Gallito de la Roca, the cock of the rock bus station, tucked away on a brooding side street that had all the open arm welcoming charm of the Gaza Strip. The baffled and concerned cabbie shot me one of those famous what is this crazy gringo possibly thinking looks and inquired what time my bus was scheduled to depart. I told him in 40 minutes. He pointed to my backpack, then to my belly button, where every armed robber in Latin America knows gringos hide their dinero in money belts tucked beneath their shirts, then slid his right index finger across his throat to indicate I would be murdered well before the bus arrived if he left me there. He wheeled around 180 degrees and deposited me three blocks away in a well-lit, though closed, Texaco gas station. I leaned my ponderous pack against a gas pump and took refuge under the most glaring light I could find, arming myself with a rubber windshield squeegee against the legions of knife-wielding banditos roaming the pre-dawn darkness of the barrio streets on the lookout for easy prey like me. Now this is ironic, I thought to myself. My first day kicking big oil out of the Amazon rainforest, and here I am already hiding for my life in the safe haven of Texaco, <clears throat> one of the single most egregious destructive forces in the Amazon for decades. <clears throat> Five minutes had not passed before an obnoxious drunk was in my face, 
pestering me in slurred Spanish to join him for a drink. By my 10th or 12th, no gracias, he finally got it through his borracho skull that I would not be accepting his invitation, and he staggered away down the street, fortunately in the opposite direction of my bus. When he disappeared around the corner, I took it as my cue to take my life into my hands and hightail it back to the bus station. To put it mildly, the blaze of lights pouring out of the now bustling bus station was a welcoming sight, but not as welcome as the sight of my new home for the next eight hours. The almost gleaming red and white bus car, they call them bus cars in Peru, the almost gleaming red and white bus car was at approximately only 20 years old, practically new by Peruvian chicken bus standards, most miraculous of all, two of its eight mismatched tires actually showed some vague traces of tread remaining. The young driver's assistant kept inserting the dipstick into the bowels of the engine, checking it for remote traces of oil, and on the third or fourth reading, apparently decided we were road ready. He slammed the engine cover shut, then monkey-like climbed the ladder to the top of the 10-foot high bus where our collective Everest of luggage was to ride out the journey. He handled my bag of cannonballs like it was a feather pillow. I watched carefully to make sure my bag was lashed down tight, then boarded the bus. Seat number 19, window to the sunrise. After a few minor skirmishes over the best seats, everyone was settled and we were ready to go. I was thrilled to see that my companion beside me was a middle-aged woman with no complaining baby in her lap, amazingly enough, who clearly had zero interest in striking up a conversation with the lunatic gringo beside her. Obviously, I was the only gringo on the whole bus, as 99% of gringo tourists choose to take the 40-minute flight instead of the grueling 19-hour descent into hell I was preparing to make. The engine sputtered and coughed to life. Three sharp toots of the horn, and we lurched off into the gathering dawn. There was no turning back now. Goodbye, Cusco and civilization. Hello, Amazon jungle. The gritty gray first light of dawn outside my foggy window began to blush pink and then a soft pastel shade of blue as our bus cruised out of the city along a comfortable paved highway. The outskirts of Cusco were soon replaced by widely scattered crumbling roadside shacks in the arid featureless countryside that reminded me vaguely of eastern New Mexico. I settled into what I naively believed was going to be a smooth eight-hour ride. As usual, in my suicidal determination to let spirit guide me on my odyssey, I had completely failed to plan for my trip. <clears throat> the total extent of my pre-trip preparation for this interplanetary bus trip had been to consult a 13-year-old guidebook, copyright 1996, which cavalierly assured its readers that the road I was to be traveling on would be paved by the year 2000. <clears throat> the book had all these complicated instructions about changing chicken buses and hitching rides on dump trucks, etc., and here I was on a comfortable, direct express bus 
to Pilcapata. Obviously, the road was going to be a smooth ribbon of asphalt the entire way. This being, after all, nine years after the promised completion of the highway improvements. Imagine my surprise then, when no more than an hour outside of downtown Cusco, the bus veered off the smooth ribbon of highway and lumbered across one of those classic Latin American bridges from an acrophobic's worst nightmare. No stranger to Latin American bus travel, I assumed, again naively, that the driver intended to stop at a small bus station in this village for a few short minutes, pick up a few passengers, then return to the highway, which I could still plainly see to my left, heading east toward the Amazon, but now hugging the opposite bank of the river we had just crossed. Well, I was wrong again. The driver never stopped. To be more precise, he barely slowed down as the road beneath our wheels quickly deteriorated into a one-lane sandy track of the side of a barren mountainside. With a mounting sense of panic, I craned my neck upward to reconnoiter the roadway ahead of us. The problem was, I could see the roadway. All I could make out was some vague series of perilous switchbacks which any intelligent person, and at that point I still numbered myself to be in that club, would obviously recognize as a llama trail and a narrow one at that. But where was the road? Was this bus going to sprout wings or what? As I pondered this mystery, I glimpsed a movement on the llama trail above us. When it hit me that this llama was in fact a huge dump truck coming directly toward us, the enormity of my situation descended over me like a cold, unwelcome fog, and it suddenly occurred to me why I was the only gringo on the bus. Bus plunge kills Austin man in Peru. I could already see the tiny headline and news blurb on page B6 of the Austin Statesman newspaper. Local realtor Hambone Littletail, 49, was killed Friday in a head-on collision between a bus and a dump truck on a remote llama trail east of Cusco, Peru. At press time, it was still unclear how the bus or the dump truck had managed to veer off the highway and on to the ancient Inca Indian footpath. A friend of Little Tales, Harv Howell, remarked of the accident, We all tried to tell that idiot he had obviously lost his mind. Serves him right, the damn fool. Howell added that Little Tales Wake will be at his house on Saturday and to please send Bud in lieu of flowers. Seriously, do you know that mildly nauseous, sweaty-palmed feeling that overtakes you when you are awaiting takeoff on an airport runway and you're making that macabre mental list of all the gruesome ways you could die in the next 10 minutes? A sick feeling that for most of us anyway, fades away after a few minutes in the air? Well, multiply that sensation by about 10 times and hold it for four hours and you will have some idea of what I was feeling right about then. As I made plans to pick my teeth out of the grill of an oncoming Mack truck in about five minutes, I had a couple of aha moment epiphanies. In addition to reading in a 13-year-old guidebook promising pavement to the Amazon by the year 2000, I also recalled reading much more recent alarming reports from environmentalists 
about a certain highway from hell from Cusco to the Amazon that the tree huggers were freaking out would soon be paved, opening the floodgates from, to everyone from loggers to big oil. I, of course, considered myself to be one of those concerned tree huggers until it dawned on me that I was obviously on that very road. Christ, what I would have given at that moment for a lousy swath of pavement, some road shoulders, and a yellow line down the middle. By, by the way, I still consider myself to be one of those anti-pavement environmentalists, but trust me, before that particular llama trail ever sees its first drop of asphalt, there will be no trees left in the Amazon jungle to hug or cut down. The other epiphany I had in my final moments before the crash was the now obvious explanation for the mysterious bus schedules in southeast Peru between Cusco and the end of the road some 160 miles to the east. The system works like this. All buses going east from Cusco to Manu National Park leave on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Meanwhile, all buses heading west from the Amazon to Cusco travel on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. I guess everyone rests on Sundays. I had just assumed that this inefficient and exasperating system had to do with the number of passengers and the length of the trip, but now as I waited to meet my own death, each time the big bus rolled around another blind curve, I understood the real reason this llama trail was at most a one-lane track. And Though the bus drivers had the brains to figure out this simple physics equation, they had no control over the boneheaded, arrogant dump truck drivers who hogged the road whenever they damn well felt like it. <clears throat> My epiphanies evaporated when the moment of truth arrived, and it was time for the bus driver and the dump truck driver to face off in their deadly game of chicken. To fully grasp the stakes involved, you need to understand just how driveway narrow of a road we're talking about here. Looking out the window from my perch approximately six feet above the roadway, the mountainside gash pretending to be a road was so narrow that I could see no roadway below us at all. <clears throat> we may as well have been on a monorail or an L train. Our only saving grace is that we were on the inside when the two vehicles met head on. The bus driver practically buried the right side of the bus into the precipice of the mountainside and came to a complete stop. The moron behind the wheel of the dump truck waved nonchalantly to the bus driver and kept right on coming. <clears throat> the only explanation I have for this for his supernatural feat is that he somehow made his dump truck fly around the bus as no other explanation works. When he passed by my window, he had one hand lazily riding the top of the steering wheel. While I recovered my breath, most of my fellow passengers went right on sleeping, never realizing how close they had just come to dying. Perhaps the most irksome thing of all about these nerve-wracking near-death experiences, a dozen or so of which I suffered and miraculously survived during my maiden plunge into the rainforest, was the fact that they detracted heavily from my enjoyment of the stupendous alpine scenery literally falling away and spreading out before me. 
I guess the lightheadedness I had suffered from in Cusco from its mere 11,000 foot altitude had made me woozy and I hadn't really considered the fact that my $9 bus ride to another planet was going to take me across the second highest mountain range on the planet and that at some 18,000 feet, the summit of Tres Cruces, three crosses <clears throat> pass, would be the highest I had ever been in my life. Earth side of a plane, anyway, except for my tiny gringo whine that the only trees to be seen were exotic imported eucalyptus and fir, and this complaint had more to do with the fact that there were precious few trees to catch our free fall when we did finally take our inevitable Peruvian plunge than anything else. The scenery, or what I could see of it through my fingers covering my eyes, was like some kind of cross between Ure, Colorado, and what I imagined a pal must look like. I wish I could tell you more about the mind-melting vistas, but I had my eyes clenched shut in terror most of the time. It's not just that easy to admire scenery. I don't care how spectacular it is when your mind is full of weird arcane, arcane details such as the wheelbase and turning radius of your run-of-the-mill Peruvian bus car. At the bottom of one particularly saliva-swallowing series of switchbacks, we finally arrived at our destination, or so I thought when we pulled up and ground to a halt on the dusty main street of some unidentified little town. As I had one of the as I had had one of the common miscommunications with one of Cusco's recalcitrant ATMs the night before and was therefore woefully underfunded for such an extended existential journey, I was pleased to see the driver had deposited me right in front of the town's only bank. I went looking for the bank's ATM. Yeah, right, Hambone. Pathetically clutching my little blue plastic lifeline to the world's biggest planet-eating bank, I went inside to beg for money like all the other peons on the outside of the bank with their hands held out. The nice lady and the not-so-nice armed security guard were about as impressed by my Visa ATM card as a blue whale would have been but impressed by the threats of a goldfish. The nice lady informed me that there was one dim ray of hope in my suddenly darkened financial picture. Maybe if I prayed really hard, I could find some alchemical way of turning plastic into paper when I got to Pilcapata. What do you mean? when I got to Pilcapata. I thought I was in goddamn Pilcapata. The nice lady at the bank informed me that I was in Palcartombo, which was the halfway point between Cusco and the real Pilcapata, which lay another four hours to the east on the other side of one of Peru's most dangerous, highest navigable mountain passes. The driver tooted his horn and the adventure cranked up again. By this time I was bound and determined to conquer my perfectly rational acrophobia and enjoy the spectacular scenery. This was actually fairly easy to accomplish as we lumbered along a remarkably level ridge line above a lovely rushing mountain river. It would be an overstatement to describe my condition as relaxed, 
but at least my perspiration was beginning to dry in the cool, dry air of Peru's Altiplano, the high plains. I managed to keep my flatlander ship together fairly well, in fact, as we began the gear-grinding ascent of the Alpine Tres Cruces Pass, and I swear I would have been able to keep it together had we not encountered barely a mile from the top of our four-hour climb a small cairn of stones deliberately placed in the middle of the narrow winding jeep trail by some good Samaritan who was trying to warn any future pilgrims heading our way of some form of impending calamity waiting just ahead. The potential death trap turned out to be a large gash in the road coming in from the left meaning the downhill side of the road. You did not need to ha have the eyes of Euclides of the, or the theorems of Pythagoras to know that the distance between the beginning of the crack on the left and the side of the mountain on the right was, without a doubt, shorter than the distance between the tires on the bus. For the first time, I detected a murmur of concern from several of my Inca Indian fellow passengers. I don't know about you, but when an Inca Indian gets a bout of acrophobia, so do I. <clears throat> The slender young driver's assistant squeezed his way through the narrow opening afforded him between the bus door and the side of the mountain from which we hung precariously. Like he had done with the questionable dipstick a few hours earlier, he made three or four test runs between the front of the bus and the yawning chasm below and to the left. Surmising that all looked reasonably well to him, he proceeded to toss the stone traffic cone down the hillside, thereby erasing any warning to future travelers behind us and motioned us on through. Then he conveniently scooted ahead to the far side of the fissure to guide us to our certain doom with some vague, optimistic hand signals to the driver. Those Inca Indians on board who had converted to Catholicism all grabbed their St. Christophers as we lurched forward. So this was it, the end of the road for yours truly, a victim of Peruvian bus plunge fever, the only known antidote of which is taking the goddamn 40 minute flight from Cusco to Manu. In hindsight, about all I can say about that terrifying next three minutes is that our bus driver figured out how to push the magic bus button that allowed us to sprout wings and fly across the roadbed canyon to freedom. There is no other explanation for it. Fifteen minutes later, we had arrived at the top of our grueling climb amid zero fanfare, not even a lousy toot of the horn. As the first law of Peruvian bus plunge physics states, quote, what goes up must come down. By the time we began our perilous plunge into the green abyss, I was a five-hour veteran of Peruvian bus travel and cavalierly assumed that I had already ex experienced and survived the worst that the Peruvian highway system had to offer. I mean, after all, how could our journey get any worse? My rhetorical question was answered in about 100 feet from the summit. As the old joke says, 
it could always be worse. It could be raining. <clears throat> I don't know why I was surprised to find it raining on the eastern slope of the Andes Mountains, considering it is one of the single wettest spots on this planet outside of the ocean. More than anything, I guess, <clears throat> it was the jarring suddenness of the transition between the almost desert-like conditions of the blue sky crowned Altiplano ecosystem on the west side of the Alpine Pass and the luxuriant vegetation and near constant rain of the mist-shrouded Peruvian cloud forest 30 seconds to the east. There's probably nowhere on earth that <clears throat> Such radically different ecosystems crash into each other with such a knife-edge narrow line of demarcation with zero transition than between Peru's Altiplano and cloud forest ecosystems along the ridge of the Andes. Speaking of crashing, we now had several more threats to add to landslides and oncoming Mack trucks. While the road had at least been dry on the climb up, now that we were pointed down, the roadbed immediately deteriorated into a soggy, soupy, slippery quagmire, and six of our eight tires had the tread and traction of snow skis. And now that we were headed down, we would be on the outside upon meeting any oncoming dump trucks. Oh well, I thought to myself as I stared glumly out the window through the gloomy fog, at least we finally have some damn trees to catch us when we take our inevitable Peruvian bus plunge. Miraculously, I even managed, almost, to enjoy the trip down through the eerie fog-shrouded cloud forest. A die-hard fan of waterfalls, I particularly like the dozen or so cascades we passed along the way. That is, until we reached one particularly pesky waterfall that erupted out of the mountainside, now on our left, my side, churned across the road in a raging torrent and continued its plunge down the mountain on our right. Needless to say, the erosive force of all this moving water had, choosed, had chewed a sizable chunk out of the right downhill side of the road, dredging up once again fatalistic calculations of Peruvian bus car wheelbases. This time, the driver didn't even bother to send his young assistant out on a recon mission. Instead, he simply turned the bus in to the waterfall itself. The pounding cascade hammered against the left side of the bus hosing down the window inches from my face as the bus sloshed on through the creek, listing wildly to the right as it did so. What possibly could be next on the list of obstacles to get over and around? Of course, let's not forget obstacles to get through. In this case, an insurmountable even by Peruvian standards, ridge of solid rock, as the indefatigable road builders had figured out years ago, the best way to get through such an obstacle was with dynamite. Hence, my first trip through a Peruvian tunnel. And I do, of course, use the term tunnel loosely here. This rough cut unsupported hole in the mountain was, at best, a mine shaft, and it goes without saying that the dimensions of this shaft were approximately one millimeter in diameter, wider than the breadth 
of your run-of-the-mill Peruvian bus car. I was so glad to see the light at the end of that damn tunnel that I hardly cared that my bag of cannonballs had just been scraped off the top of the bus as I was convinced it had been, finally, after eight hours of kidney jamming, nail-biting misery with a beautiful view, we arrived unceremoniously on the dusty, dirty main street of Pilcapata, Peru. As downtrodden and depressing as the muggy frontier jungle town first appeared to me, I was encouraged by two things. First, my luggage had somehow survived the arduous journey intact and, for the most part, dry. Even more miraculously, there was a bus that appeared to be all set to pull out to my next destination, Atalaya, some six miles further down the highway. As it was now 1 p.m., and I was on the verge of starvation, my belly was screaming for food, but my flat wallet was screaming even louder for cash. My wallet won the screaming match. I lugged my load of cannonballs over to the waiting bus where the driver informed me we would be leaving in 30 minutes. Although this meant my belly would not be satisfied until Atalaya, I would at least have time to satisfy my hungry wallet with some sorely needed soles. Soles are Peruvian dollars. I set off constantly in search of an ATM like I was on Market Street in San Francisco. My first stop was the outhouse-sized tourist information kiosk. By the looks and smell of the abandoned outhouse, I figured Pizarro must have been the last tourist to stop there for information. Spirit, that little tour guide on my left shoulder, whispered to me that I had about as much chance of finding a bank, much less an ATM, in Pilcapata, Peru, as I had of encountering a polar bear. As usual, Spirit was on the money, but I wasn't. With dimming hopes and rising gringo panic, I trudged up one hot sidewalk and down the other, searching in vain for a bank or, or anyone even remotely resembling a money changer. Fearing the bus would leave without me, I hustled back, defeated and depressed. It was May 22nd. It would be August before I would see a bank again, assuming, of course, I had the fare to get back to Cusco or Puerto Baldonado by that time. Like 8 million or so other Peruvian peasants, I had about two dollars per diem to survive the summer. In other words, I was fucked. As I sat there alone on the increasingly sweltering empty bus, battling starvation and wondering where the driver and, uh, and other passengers were, it was now well past 1.30, I thought I heard the motor of the plane full of gringo tourists flying over me on their comfortable 40-minute flight from Cusco to my new national park. Probably just my stomach growling. A well-dressed Peruvian businessman boarded the bus, and we struck up a conversation in my broken Spanish and his even more broken English. It turned out that he was a naturopath from Lima, bound for the jungle town of Puerto Maldonado to purchase rainforest herbs and medicinal plants from the Indian tribes in the area. He assured me the trip was relatively short, straightforward, and very cheap if you knew what you were doing. No comment. 
He invited me to tag along with him, but I explained that I would be laying over in Atalaya for three nights to hang out in an isolated jungle camp with a Stone Age Indian from one of the uncontacted tribes from deep within the Manu rainforest. Startled by this announcement and insisting that I repeat it to make sure he understood me correctly, he vigorously shook his head no and shot me that same pain, here's a stupid gringo begging to be murdered look that I had see received from the cab driver at 4 a.m. I couldn't make out much of his barrage of Spanish other than muy agresivo, very aggressive, peligro, dangerous, and cuidado, be careful. I'm not certain, but I think he told me that even though he does business with primitive Indians, he let them come to him in town and he would never do something so foolhardy as to head into the jungle on his own on their turf and their terms. Realizing the stupid hard-headed gringo was not going to be dissuaded from his suicidal misadventure, he opened his newspaper and shut me out of his thoughts. About that time, a squat black bird with a bright yellow mohawk, roughly the size and shape of a plump hen, landed on top of our bus parked squarely in the middle of Pilkapata's business district. I could hear the clicking of his toenails tapping along the top of the bus. I had been in the jungle a little over an hour and had already had my first wildlife sighting, a curacao. The curacao stimulated my gastronomic juices more than my ornithological curiosity, I must admit. I asked the naturopath if they were good to eat and he assured me, patting his stomach, that they were indeed muy sabroso. Bush meat fantasies of a big plate of fried curacao with a mountain of fried yucca chips on the side finally drove me off the bus to a nearby market where I managed to scrounge two bags of stale Lay's potato chips and a lukewarm Coke to stave off impending starvation. I was afraid to leave the umbilicus of the bus to go have a real meal real meal knowing the vagaries of Peruvian restaurant service. Finally, at 4 p.m., two and a half hours past our scheduled departure, one of the many oxymorons in the Amazon jungle, the bus was swarmed with several dozen Indians who knew the secret code of how to determine when a bus is really scheduled to depart. A stern-faced young native woman with ubiquitous baby in tow plopped down in the seat beside me, making herself at home like she wasn't scrunched up next to some loco gringo. She pulled out her left tit and began nursing her baby. This position, of course, meant the kid's feet were now free to kick and pummel me, which is exactly what he did with great relish and abandon for the duration of our 40-minute ride. Our captain gave the requisite three-minute warning toot. After a few last-minute requisite skirmishes over seating and luggage arrangements, we lurched off into the jungle. Despite the steady drubbing I was getting from the nursing baby, I managed to enjoy the beautiful six-mile slog through the tunnel of jungle growth as we slipped and slid our way to Atalaya. We rolled into the remote riverside village with just enough daylight left for me to track down my $5 hotel room for the night complete with private bath and actual glass in the window.